Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're continuing on in our study of the prophet Amos. This is our, our ninth week in that part of the study. So we're glad you can join us. Where it's just wonderful to be able to get together in God's word and Amen. share his word. Yes. Because his word is life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, we're going to start where we left off. Before we do that, Alice is going to read a little bit from kind of where we left off last week. But even before that, Brother Mark is going to ask for God's blessing on our time together yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word and just let us get what you want us to get out of it. And we just pray that we might go forth and live better in your name. Amen. Yes, amen. amen. Live the word. Live the word. Live the word. You got to believe it in your heart. You have to confess That's it with your word. mouth and you got to live the word. You got to do it. All right. As I say, we're in chapter three. <clears throat> and just to kind of catch up again, I want Alice to read uh, chapter three, verses 11, 12, and 13. And then we'll pick up the new part of the study. Okay. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you, and your citadels will be looted. Thus says the Lord, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria be snatched away, with the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God. The God of hosts. Oh, yeah. Well, remember, this is God speaking a word against Israel at this time because of their disobedience and their rebellion. All right, so we're going to start now at verse 14, Amos 3, 14. And, and, and the Lord says, For on the day that I punish Israel's transgressions, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. God is going to punish Israel's transgressions. Now, this is something I, I tell you, in my experience, most of the church doesn't want to hear this kind of message. OK. But the simple fact of the matter is God punishes sin. OK. And the wrath of God will come to punish sin. All sin. Sin does not go unpunished. But remember there is an appointed time for everything, as Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3.1. So, to the unsaved, repentant sinners, the Apostle Paul writes this in, in Romans chapter 2. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Wait a minute. According to our deeds? Mm. Absolutely. Because your deeds are either sinful, right? Yes. Well, let me just say, you know, the apostles came to Jesus and they said to him, what, what, we must do, what must we do to do the works of God? You know what Jesus said? Believe, believe on me. That's what he said. Believe on him whom the Father sent. All right. All right. So that was what Paul wrote or said that God was speaking to the unrepentant, to the one who has turned to the Lord in repentance and has accepted the free gift of God. Then listen to what he said to the Romans there. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Okay, Romans 5, 9. So unrepentant sinners, they're gonna they're gonna face the wrath of God. Yes. Repentant sinners, I mean, we're, you know that's the deal. We're all sinners, but you're either a repentant sinner or an unrepentant sinner. Mm -hmm. Repentant sinners will be saved from that wrath, mm -hmm. but the sin still has to be, in fact, paid. Well, in fact, it has been yeah. punished. Ah, yes. It's been punished, and at oh. What a cost. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him, speaking of Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
And thus, think about what is, uh, this incredible chapter, Isaiah 53. Mm. Think about what God spoke through the prophet Isaiah. Speak, this is about speaking about the coming Messiah. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Salvation is the free gift of God. But I promise you, salvation was not free. The cross was the cost. And, and by the way, while it is absolutely true that repentance and forgiveness can take away the punishment from our lives, right? It does not necessarily take away all the consequence from sin in our life. I always use the example, imagine if there's a, a young Christian couple and they are having, not married, and they are having sexual relations, right? That's sin. That is sin. But if they come before God and ask for forgiveness for that sin, if they're faithful to confess that sin, God is faithful and just to forgive that sin. Yes. But the girls might still be pregnant. There's always a consequence. And the baby will be born. That's a consequence of the sin. Okay? Now, that's that's not a bad, terrible bad consequence, all right? But the consequences can be terrible. And even though God takes away the punishment, you know, there's, there is... I mean, you could wind up in jail. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've actually known uh, people who are murderers, forgiven by God. Some of them now have a great prison ministry. Mm -hmm. And I know a couple that have actually been set free just through the working of God. Okay. All right. So then he goes on in, in, that, in that verse in 4 and talks about the altars of Bethel. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. Bethel, first of all, in Hebrew, that literally means house of God. Wow. Beth means house, faith, and El is, is God. So it's the house, yeah, um, Beth the bar. Mm -hmm. House of the word. The house of the word. <clears throat> Bethel has a very, very considerable history in the scriptures. In as much as Abraham stayed there, when God called Abraham to go, right, mm -hmm. and he went, one of the places he stopped on his way where, and he wound up going to Egypt, was Bethel. And while he was at Bethel, he sent up his tent. He set up his tent. In other words, he, he put himself in residence for some brief attendance for a brief period of time, but he resided. And while he was there, he built an altar at Bethel. And on the way back from Egypt, he stopped there again. All right. That's the place you ever hear, you know, the dream that Jacob had, Jacob's mm -hmm. ladder. Yes. And he's going, that was at Bethel that he had that dream. Okay. When Solomon died, King Solomon died, mm -hmm. and the kingdom divided into two kingdoms now. Remember, the, the, the 12 tribes had been one kingdom, right. under David and under Solomon. But now they were divided into the north, which is Israel, which is God, what God is dealing with, and in the south, Judea, right, and Judah, where Jerusalem was, all right? So when he, the nation was divided into two. And Solomon's son, Jeroboam, became the first king of Israel. And now, remember, that's separated from Judah, where the temple was, right? Mm -hmm. Solomon had built the temple. David had been in that, in that city, the city of God, all right? Jerusalem. And then Solomon built the temple there in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. The temple was built that in the Holy of Holies, God's name could reside there, all right? Right. Okay. It had become, Jerusalem was the center of, of put quotes on this, religious life of the people of God. But then it says, when the nation divided, you got Israel in the north, mm -hmm. Jeroboam said this, okay? I'll read it, First Kings 12, 26 through 30, I'm reading. Okay. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord. 
even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, is it to the people, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. Mm. Now this, this is a political issue. Jeroboam, now the kingdom is divided. He's afraid that if the people are going down south of Jerusalem to worship, they're going to be they're going to be enticed to return at the nation, all right, and, and serve. And he doesn't want that for for his own political reasons. Okay, so they're going to worship. So he, so what he did is he set up an alternative. Instead of having to go to Jerusalem, he set up an altar at Bethel, and he set up the golden calf at Bethel. For the people as a place of worship, right? Now that that golden calf was the same God that the people had worshipped in the wilderness while Moses was up the mountain receiving the word, the, the, the commands from the Lord, right? Yeah, they threw their golden and because as, as in the wilderness, it was once again a counterfeit. In First Kings twelve thirty two, it says this: Jeroboam instituted a feast. In the eighth month of the 15th day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Remember, when Moses was up the mountain and Aaron, the people are saying, you know, Moses, he's not coming back. He's been going too long. So they decided to make... <laughs> An, an image. An image to worship. An image to worship. And if you know the story, if you don't know the story, please go to Exodus, find it and read it, okay? Because when Moses comes down and hears the sound of what's going on, the partying, yeah. that the yeah. that the people Orange. of God are having, dancing around this, this golden calf, this idol that they had made. And remember, they were treating it as God. But they were treating it as they were being faithful to the God who had delivered them from Egypt. They're saying this this is the God that delivered us, right? So that God didn't go away because Satan hasn't gone away, yeah. right? He comes, he's a counterfeiter. He's a liar by nature. But he said, and you know, this is in Isaiah 14, he says, I will make myself like the most high God. So it's an imitation. And that's why Jeroboam, they were calling it a feast. They were calling it the, in the wilderness a, a feast. Now he set up a feast to compete with what is going on, what God had set up in Jerusalem. Right? Do you know what the calf is representative? I mean, what is the yeah, Satan? No, no. Uh, I'm, I'm being yeah, facetious. No, I knew. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the place that they would have experienced golden calves mm -hmm. as a thing to worship would have been in Egypt. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Egypt That's has right. all kinds of those idols. Idolatry yeah. is common to fallen man. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things while they were up there, while Moses was up there getting instruction from God, one of the things that God said to him, don't you tell the people, don't make any idols. idols. Don't make any images. graven images. images. And there they are. The people are got down at the bottom of the mountain, and they're making graven images. And here it's still going on. And you want to know something? It's still going on. This was a big issue. I don't think most people, most Christians are aware of the tension, the trials, the tribulations, and the problems that existed in the early, uh, not, in the, not in the early church in times of biblical times, mm -hmm. But thereafter, when the church started to make all kinds of graven images, I, I'm telling you, it's created all kinds of problems. One, I think it was I, Emperor Leo. Um, I can't get my dates right here. But he, in a reform move in the church, mm -hmm. wanted to do away with all of the images, the, the, the images that had been established in the church. And basically, you're talking about the Roman Church at that point, or the Orthodox in the East. And the Pope excommunicated him, or more threatened to excommunicate him for wanting to do that. Okay? God never intended that we worship or spend our time at a statue or, or a graven image. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. If you can't deal with that, hey, that's between you and the Lord, okay? Because even the Nehushtan? Nehushtan. Because he had them 
create that, but he had told him to destroy it. Alice is talking about an event in the wilderness when because of the disobedience of the people, Mm -hmm. God had snakes were coming out in the wilderness and they were biting the people and the people are dying left and right. So God told Moses and Aaron to, to make a graven serpent, okay, a bronze serpent, and hold it up. And when the people looked at that, they were healed, okay? And you say, well, he's telling them, they weren't worshiping it. No, they were just looking upon it. And the reason was, this was a foreshadowing of the eternal truth. Jesus. All right? Because they were looking at the very thing that killed them. That, was, that had been, now it's being lifted up. And they're looking up at the very thing that was bringing death to them. Right. Now, when Jesus is put upon the cross, remember, it says it was sin that was nailed to that cross. He became sin. He became sin, right? So he, looking up at Jesus on the cross, you're looking at the only thing that can save you from sin. But later on, the people are still carrying this brazen serpent, and God rebukes them for it because it was never meant to be something to be carried around and, and bowed down before, okay? It had a purpose for a moment. There's an appointed time for everything. Once that purpose is over, God is not into graven images, graven images right? Okay. All right. Let me let me just read this because Bethel and the, the what was created at Bethel and was proclaimed as true religion, right, competing with Jerusalem, was there to satisfy the desires of the people. Because he says still the people of God, and there is an inherent inbred need and desire. God formed the people to declare his praise. Right? So they have to, and Jeroboam politically doesn't want them going down to Jerusalem. So he sets up an alternative. Do you know that there's plenty of alternative religion within the church? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm just Exodus 32, 1 to 4. I'm just going to read that account now. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people ascended about Aaron and said to him, Come. Make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Ooh. It was not. No, it was not. When, and when Moses confronts him, he says, well, you know, I'm paraphrasing. You, okay. He says, well, we just threw the gold in and out popped this calf. That's, that's what he says. Yeah. Because when you're in sin, you're stupid. Okay. The Lord and Moses did not think. That this take this lightly. They did not think. They did not think that it was the God that delivered them from Egypt. They knew it wasn't the God. And and later on in the history of the Jews, when there was a revival of sorts during the reign of King Josiah in Judah, his reforms included taking away most of the wrong things in Bethel. Okay, but they left. They left the calf there, the golden. The golden image, okay? So Bethel had a, not only had an interesting history, Bethel also had an interesting future. Mm-hmm. For here later in Amos, he says, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live, but do not resort to Bethel. Do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. Mm. Right, God, you know, if it doesn't look like God is acting now, I promise you, he's going to act, okay? It's in his time. That's because Bethel became the epitome of apostasy. It was a sanctuary and a royal residence of the king. The king of Israel had his royal residence up there at Bethel. And it was the home of Amaziah, the priest of the golden calf at Bethel. It had become the example of a professional prophet for prophet who was the enemy of the word of God. 
Mm-hmm. Remember, this was a place, okay? The school of the prophets? Where the school of the prophets was. Professional prophets, mm-hmm. all right? He commanded Amos to leave the land and no longer prophesy. This is, this is the priest. He, t- he says to Amos, you know, leave the land, all right? Don't prophesy here. Well, much to his detriment and the detriment of his family, because God punished him for that. This is what God said to Amaziah, the priest up at Bethel. He said, therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife will become a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by a measuring line, and you yourself will die upon unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. This is the prophecy of Amos in chapter 7. God speaking to him. God punishes sin. Yes. The only way to escape it is to repent and, and re- receive that free gift. All right? Bethel is all about self-made religion. Right? Because of the division in the land between the Jews in the south and them, they constructed their own altars there in the north. Now, Paul who was expert at religion before he got saved, said this in Colossians 2, I'm going to read 18 through 13. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use. In accordance with the commandments and teaching of men, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. I got to tell you, there's a lot of self-made religion around. That, that I mean, if you can't see that here, okay? We don't earn our salvation anyway. It is the free gift of God, lest any man should boast, Okay. The issue here at, 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 in Samaria, at Bethel, though, boils down to this. Because this is the area of Samaria, right? And this, the Jews now and the Samaritans don't get along well together. But think about this account in John chapter 4, when Jesus goes to the well, all right, and encounters a Samaritan woman. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped at this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But Jesus went on to say, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 23 to 24. You know what? We've got a lot of buildings that we set up, massive, glorious, beautiful buildings, and a lot of them may be self-made religion, okay? God is still seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The building doesn't matter. Bethel resent, re- totally represented the attempted mixture of God's plan and man's plan. And like the gathering at Laodicea in the book of Revelation, it was that intertwining of the word with the world, the hot and the cold, that resulted in them being lukewarm, having a lukewarm faith, which literally made Jesus want to vomit them out, made him sick to his stomach. So go go read about the church of Laodicea in in Revelation chapter 3. This is serious stuff. Yes, it is. So let me move right along here. Amos, I'm going to read from 3.15 now and include, go into the fourth chapter, the first verse. I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. The houses of ivory will also perish, and the great houses 
will come to an end, declares the Lord. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. This points to the great prosperity in Israel at this time. I mentioned this in the beginning of the study, right? Nine weeks ago. This prosperity was enjoyed by some, but surely not all. More accurately, the prosperity of some at the time was at the expense of others. Quite like what James would write hundreds of years later, James 1, 5, verses 1 through 6, says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten, your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your heart in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Okay? I said in the very beginning, okay, well, let me just read one more verse. In Luke, Luke 6, okay? We're going to really get into this a little bit next week here. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Luke 6, 24, 25. That's the words of Jesus Christ. Is this a social gospel? No, it's the gospel. It is the word. Okay. We, we need to understand this. If there, and I said this, I think, last week and maybe the week before. <clears throat> if there is a bias when it comes to rich and poor in the word, God certainly leans in favor of the poor. Yes. And I want to talk to you. <clears throat> And I need you to be back and, and be part of this because this truly is important and it is one of the great heresies of the church today. Jesus said this, no man or woman can be my disciple unless he gives up all his possessions. Okay? Blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall, theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. A true disciple of the Lord knows that he or she cannot own anything. Now, come back and I'll explain that in our next session. But be back. It's a, it is the word of God. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Most importantly, Father, we thank you for your word who has made flesh and dwelt among us. Who not only spoke and told us the way we're supposed to live, he showed us by example how we're to live. Father, I pray that our lives would bring glory to your name, that our lives would be a living testimony of the riches of your salvation in our life. We praise you and thank you for the work that you've done, for the work that your son Jesus did upon that cross, that we might have the fullness of the abundance of life that he desired for us. In Jesus' name. Well, be back next week. I'm telling you, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my truth.